give me a second. No problem at all. Just let me know when you're ready. Recording is up. Recording is up and running. Uh, Leon, floor is all yours. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so pleasure to be with you all here today. Um, it's been an absolutely fantastic weekend so far um, at the Power BI Bootcamp and what a tough act to follow um, behind Brian. I was actually quite busy in the in the background there trying to get my um, the stock market up and running myself. So slightly behind schedule, but what a fantastic session so far. Um, so I'm here with you today to go through machine learning in Power BI. Uh, now this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, I absolutely love data, machine learning, AI, data science, um, and everything along those lines. So to display it in Power BI today is going to be absolutely amazing for me. Um, I want this to be a very interactive session, um, so please do feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, also, it would be great. I know that this is an international conference, so it'd be really good if you can put in the chat where you're calling in from. Uh, that would be great. So as we move through, um, so as some of you may well know, my name's Leon Gordon and I represent a company called Onyx Data. So Onyx Data is a UK based consultancy whereby I'm currently deployed as a head of analytics within a financial services role. Um, if you want to uh, connect with me and follow me in a bit more detail, you have my LinkedIn web address and I'm also the admin and chair of the Microsoft Power BI UK user group. OK, so hi, Matthias from Germany. Hi, Abir from Bangladesh. So very, very, very international, which is what we like. So in today's session, what will we cover? We're going to understand what is machine learning, how we can benefit from machine learning in Power BI, what tools do we need, and how to implement a PyCharm machine learning solution in Power BI. And I'll also give you some uh, resources to continue learning as well following today's session. Hi, Vanessa, straight out of Portsmouth. I hope it's sunny down there today as well. OK. So let's dive in. So what is machine learning? So machine learning is a data analytics technique that teaches computers to do what comes naturally to humans and animals, and that is to learn from experience. OK, machine learning algorithms use computational methods to learn information directly from data without re without relying on a predetermined equation as a model. So let's focus in on some key points there. We are saying that with machine learning, we can teach our computer to learn from experience and learn information directly from data. What I want to do is just go in and give a little bit of a brief history on machine learning. Um, so some of you may or may not know that machine learning dates back to the 1940s. Um, and actually a gentleman, uh, Arthur Samuel, who's a computer scientist at IBM, was a pioneer in AI and computer gaming, coined the term machine learning in 1952. Um, Arthur designed a computer program for playing checkers. The more the program played the game, the more it learned from its experience. Um, and it was thanks to an algorithm called the Minimax algorithm. Um, but machine learning didn't really take off until the late 1990s when IBM developed its Deep Blue supercomputer. Now, Deep Blue is famous for actually beating the world chess champion at the time, Gary Kasparov, in 1997. Um, just a few more hellos uh, to the to the community. So hi, uh, Hassam, and hi to Japana as well from Glasgow. Um, to answer your question, Haresh, in terms of zooming in, I'm actually using an ultra wide monitor um, today. So this is this is the best we're going to get for the time being, unfortunately. Um, if we look at the evolution of machine learning, and I've, I've picked the rise of the robots um, visual for this, uh, because everybody, when we discuss machine learning and AI, um, everybody's very afraid of in terms of jobs and uh, the computers and, and the algorithms taking over. Um, I can tell you that's not the case, um, hopefully not anytime soon either. Um, so again, just a bit of an evolution over machine learning. Um, in 1949, Donald Hebb published The Organization of Behavior, uh, which if you haven't read, I, I, I really suggest you, um, you, you take a look at that. Um, and in 1950, as I'm sure the, uh, the majority of you are aware, Alan Turing invented the Turing test. Um, as I previously mentioned, in 1952, Arthur, Arthur Samuel developed a computer game of checkers. Uh, 1979, um, prior to Tesla, um, Stanford students actually built the Stanford cart, which was a remotely controlled autonomous cart. Um, and in 1997, again, as previously mentioned, IBM's supercomputer uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in chess. 
For fast forward to 2012, Google developed Google Brain, an ML, I'm sorry, machine learning algorithm for recognizing cats in images and videos. Um, Facebook in 2014 actually created DeepFace, which is a facial recogni recognition system for detecting faces and images. Uh, and in 2016, Google's AI powered AlphaGo beat a professional player in Go, which is an abstract and very difficult um, strategy board game. If you try to play it, I'm sure that um, <laughs> I'm sure you'd agree with me there. Um, hi to AJ from New Glasgow in Canada and Swanard from India. And hi, Rishi, thanks for tuning in as well. I'm sure that no computers will be able to take over your jobs. <laughs> OK, so moving on, how can we benefit from machine learning in Power BI? Well, there's an absolute plethora of, of um, of benefits that we can have in Power BI from implementing machine learning. Um, so obviously we can have data inputted from from unlimited resources. Um, machine learning in Power BI is, is absolutely rapid um, in terms of processing times. We can start to get real time predictions. Now, partic particularly for customer led engagements, we can start to identify customer churn analysis. So this is customers subscribing and then being cancelled. Uh, we can start to look at customer leads and conversions and also something which is which is very high on the financial radar um, insurance, etc. is the prediction of fraud. OK. So what we can start to do now is look at some tools that we can integrate uh, within and and outside of Power BI to aid us on our machine learning journey. So as I'm sure um, the majority of you are aware, um, Azure does have a machine learning studio and also you do have some machine learning functions available to you within Power BI. Now in this session, I've opted to go the external route. So we're going to look at a tool called Anaconda. Um, now, Anaconda is a is a data science development toolkit, really, uh, which is absolutely um, it's been adopted by a lot of users across the world, 25 million um, to be precise, and it really is the easiest way to perform Python, R, data science, and machine learning on a single machine. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail in a moment. Now. PyCarrot um, is an open source, low code machine learning library, which is, and I would, again, following this session, please do, I will put the links to um, these websites within the chat. Um, I, I absolutely um, believe that you should be moving forward and looking into, into these tools. In this session, we're going to show you why. So let's make the machine learn. Um, and this is an iRobot and no machines were actually harmed in the making of this webinar. So I'm just going to dive out to my desktop and we're going to go across to Firefox and start to look at, um, as I mentioned, Anaconda. So you can download Anaconda from the Anaconda site. Now the individual edition um, is absolutely free to download and you can download it directly from here. Now I've already downloaded and installed it on this system and when you do that you'll have a couple of options so what i will show you first and foremost is the anaconda navigator now as i mentioned anaconda is a fantastic toolkit to start to explore data science across the board some of you may have heard of um, programs like spider jupyter note no, sorry jupyter note book um, and others. Now what Anaconda does is it gives you um, all of these tools within a single environment. OK, so just as um, just as this loads for us, I'll just say hello to Ives from from London um, and Matthias. Yes, um, you're very correct. I actually um, in one of my previous roles uh, working for for an estate agency, we looked at how we can predict fraud. There was some in-house fraud happening across the company um, and we did indeed look at how we could predict fraud across across the company. At this time, we didn't data science wasn't available to us. It was very much in its infancy, um, so we looked at SQL. But yes, predicting fraud through machine learning is very popular. OK, so hopefully now you can see uh, the Anaconda Navigator. So once you have Anaconda installed on your system, you can see that it actually gives you the option to install or launch further data science tools. So as I mentioned, the likes of Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we also have something which I will show you um, uh, very briefly shortly, which is um, Spider, which is a Python IDE uh, and the likes of PyCharm, etc. OK, so what we need to do um, for the purposes of this is start up 
a new environment. So I'm actually going to show you and Anaconda from the command prompt. OK, so when you fire up Anaconda from the command prompt, uh, you'll be presented with a green screen. It looks a lot like a terminal. Um, now, within this environment, what we can do is create an environment within our Anaconda install and you can have as many environments as as you need and within them you can have different versions of python python modules um, all installed within their own environments so to do this you need to type activate and i'll do it all lowercase activate and for this example let's create an environment called data science OK, we hit enter and you'll notice that we've gone from our base environment to our data science environment. OK, now now that we're in our new environment, data science, what we want to do is install PyCarrot. OK, now once we have um, our terminal up and running, this is very simple to do. We use a program called pip and we type install and then we want to get PyCarrot. OK. Now this will just loop through and I've already got PyCarrot installed in the system, so it will it will run through very quickly. And as you can see, all of the requirements are already satisfied and my environment now has PyCarrot installed. Now, believe me, we will be looking at Power BI. So at this moment, we will switch across to our Power BI environment. And I already have Dex Studio, what do you want? We don't want you at the moment. Perfect. Right. So I already have an untitled um, Power BI file open. So now we need to configure Power BI to be able to absorb our Python environment. OK. So we go to cost of file. Go to options and settings. Options. And we'll be presented with our options screen and we want to look at Python scripting. Now. In this environment, we want to tell Power BI that our Python home directory is actually an other directory. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. It's actually a different directory to the default. OK, now where I've installed is if we go to, we just go across to the end. You'll notice that this looks at my new environment, which we've called data science. OK, so we browse across and now we're in our new environment. OK, so once we've got that, we can hit OK. And Power BI is now up and running um, for our new Python environment. OK, now in this example, what we're going to do is look at um, a data set which is very popular in data, in data science. And this is from an individual called Arshid, and it is the Iris Flower data set. So again, I will push this um, link into into the chat and you can download it directly um, from Kaggle ready to be imported into Power BI. OK, so now we've run through. We've got our environment set up. We've installed Anaconda. We've installed PyCarrot. We have optimized Power BI to take our Python environment. And now we're going to go and get our data. So prior to this session, I've actually already downloaded the Kaggle data set. So we have Iris label here. OK, so let's go and get our data. It's going to be a text CSV. And we're going to look at bringing in. Iris label. OK, so um, as you're all familiar, we get the option to load or transform our data and we can start to look at um, a, a brief look at the first um, 200 rows of our data. So we have the sepal length sepal width, petal length, petal width, and the species. So what I'm going to do is just load this data up, which will just take a moment. OK, Haresh, I'm sorry that you've had some difficulties previously in installing PyCarrot in the past. I would recommend that if you do um, install Anaconda as an environment and use pip to install PyCarrot, um, then you'll be up and running um, very quickly as I've just as I've just demonstrated. Kevin, thank you very much for your feedback. Um, please do elaborate. Uh, like I say, machine learning and Power BI is very, very, very powerful. OK, so with this being the case, we can start to take a brief look um, as I mentioned our data. So what we have here is flowers and they are currently 
in three different categories. So we have the iris, which is Setusa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Okay, now what we're going to do using PyCarrot is feeding a data set where we're going to start to predict um, the species. Okay, so to do this, what we want to do is open up Uh, iris with a label in Excel. Okay, and we want to remove our species column. Okay, and we'll just go and save. And we'll save this as iris no label. Okay, now once we've saved this, we'll have a new file within our folder called iris no label. Now we want to move back and import this into Power BI. So we're going to go to get data, text CSV, and with this we want to get iris no label. Okay, now you'll notice that this file is exactly the same, but we don't have our species being determined. Okay, so what we want to do is we're going to look at transforming our data again. I'll just make this full screen so hopefully you can see it a little bit easier. OK, now we just want to make sure that all of our data types are coming through as expected. So sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, all as decimals, which is perfect. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to transform. And we're going to run a Python script. OK, now within this script, we're going to import uh, a carrot clustering, and we're going to import everything from this data set. Okay, so our data set equals get cluster. And then we want to get the whole data set. And we want to split this out into, we realized that earlier we had three different species and we want our Python script to return us three different clusters. Okay, we're gonna continue. And we're gonna ignore the privacy levels just for now. Okay, this may take a moment to move forward. Okay. Her name is not getting defined. Okay, so we'll just try that again. It's always the way on a live session. It doesn't want to run as expected. Okay, data set. From PyCarrot cluster and import, data set equals dot get, number of clusters equals three. Okay, this gives us an ADO.net error, so let me just close this down. And then we'll go back in. For times like this, it's always it's always good to have one that you prepared earlier, just in case you need to revert as we do here. So what I'll do is I'll just pick back up from where we were. OK, you'll notice that we have our Python script. OK, so as I mentioned from PyCarrot, we're going to look at our clustering import. We're going to import everything. We're going to get our data set, which equals get clusters. And again, as I mentioned, in this case, the amount of clusters for our species is free. OK, once we hit OK. It will show us our table. We can then expand our table. OK, and then what you'll notice is that we now have an additional column which is called data set. OK, and you'll notice an additional column as well at the end, which is cluster one, cluster zero, cluster two. So PyCarrot is now working. It's starting to evaluate the data that's being presented to it and return different clusters. OK. Now, these clusters in this case will represent our species. 
Now, what we can do is just move forward through our steps and we've removed the data set column as that's no longer required. And in this case, we've looked to change our data types as well. So previously where we had um, <coughs> a type of number, we've now applied them to be decimals. So what we can do is close and apply this. And now we have a trained data set. So originally we had iris label. And as you can see here, this is where we have our species, Setosa, Versicolor, Virginica. Okay. And in our new data set with no label where we've run PyCarrot, again, as I mentioned, you can see the different types of clusters. Now I've pulled together the visualizations here, but for the purposes of this demonstration, we can run through and do this again. Okay. So what we're going to use is the scatter plot. And exists in, in this example, we're going to look at our trained or sorry, our, our actual testing data set. So in here, we're going to pull in from the label table and we're going to look at for our legend species. For our X axis, it will be the petal width, isn't it? Yep, petal width. And for our Y axis, we're going to look at sepal length. OK, now, as you'll notice, Power BI has applied a summarization. So <coughs> excuse me, we just need to let it know to not summarize our data. And we can see that our data set with a label. Looks like this, OK? Now, again, we can see very clearly the different types of clustering we have around the iris tosa the iris versicolor and the iris virginica. OK, now what we want to do is now look at our trained data set. So this is our data set with no label where we've applied the machine learning. OK, so we're going to create another. Scatter plot. And in here we're going to look at again. Cluster which now represents our species, don't forget. We're going to look at petal width and also sepal length. Now, once again, what you'll notice is that Power BI has applied some, some summarization. Okay, so we're just going to remove those and don't summarize, okay. Now, for PyCarrot, it's something that we've done very briefly with a couple of lines of code. You can start to see that our clustering is very, very, very accurate, okay? You'll notice that we have an outlier here, which is incorrectly uh, classified. Um, but as, aside from that, we have uh, one here again, which is incorrectly classified. You can just highlight these here. OK. But aside from that, you'll notice that across the broad data set, most of the classifications are, are really, really accurate. Now, based on the fact that we've just pulled this in, uh, it's a ready made library. We only have a few lines of code to apply. This can become super, super powerful. In this example, I've looked at the use of um, of categorizing flowers, but in a real life scenario, you could look at categorizing customers, categorizing products, and how you can apply machine learning over time to start to be able to pull together um, these different types of these different types of categories. Um, so that's what I wanted to run through with you today. A very, very, very brief look into um, how we can do classification using PyCarrot within Power BI. And if I just run back to um, our presentation, so we have a question from Rishi off the back of that. Um, how does this compare to just using the standard clustering feature on a scatter plot in Power BI? Um, great question, Rishi. And with this, using Python allows it to be um, very much more powerful because you have the aspects to be able to go and customize. Um, PyCarrot is a, is a very extremely powerful library, which I do suggest, and I'll give links following um, this session into how we can look into it further. Um, but the main um, benefit you get of using um, PyCarrot and Python within Power BI is the ad additional customization and to be able to enhance um, what you're looking at in terms of the machine learning buckets, clusters, um, et cetera. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay. I just jump back to my presentation. Okay. So what we've done there is we've 
gone through and put together um, an anaconda environment. We've also um, set Power BI up to actually read um, our information from the Anaconda environment. We've installed PyCarrot and we've seen how we can use PyCarrot um, to simply classify um, data, perform clusters uh, very quickly. Um, and obviously, like I say, you could feed this into a productionized environment um, because everything is actually held within the PBIX file. OK, so we just move forward. So we now have a vision. Now, some of the ways that we can look to take it to the next level is start to look at how we can detect outliers in, in PyCarrot, topic distribution. Uh, we can also start to look at, um, again, some, some further ML algorithms, looking at association rule mining. Um, this, this is really to give you a primer in how you can install and set up your Python um, environment to be able to be um, taken, far, taken further and visualized within Power BI. So as I previously mentioned, I do have some more resources available for you. Um, so towards data science, which if you're not familiar with it already, um, is a fantastic resource for anything machine learning based, and they have some great insightful articles on PyCarrot. Uh, we also look at KD Nuggets, again, very, very um, uh, popular blog within the data science um, and machine learning um, industry um, towards data science. And as I mentioned previously, Anaconda, and Microsoft itself. So if you want to look into Azure machine learning or machine learning functions within Power Query, um, then this, these are just some of the resources that I'll be able to share with you following this session. OK, so I'd like to open up the floor for any questions that you may have. I know that we've had a couple coming through on the chat as well um, and some fantastic feedback. Obviously, this isn't everybody's cup of tea, which is absolutely fine. We're here to try and look at different ways of how we can portray and use Power BI um, to get to our to get to answers to our questions um, a lot quicker. OK, well, thank you, everyone. Um, like I say, that's my session for today, um, looking at machine learning within Power BI. If you do want to follow me further in the future, then please do reach out to me on LinkedIn via the web. Um, and obviously, as I did mention, the Microsoft Power BI UK user group, whereby we do have biweekly webinars looking at how we can, um, again, continue to help the, the community learn further in the future. Uh, Leon? Um, just a question from my end. It's um, do I usually use Python for doing a lot of data massaging? Um, uh, this uh, so, for example, now you have you can use visualization as well as massaging of data. So, so where does the Power BI fits into the whole whole stuff into this um, into the whole solution packaging or a whole like that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from from my perspective, Power BI really is the hub. I mean, we've we've seen um, in recent times, and Microsoft have alluded to this, although they haven't came come out and said it explicitly yet. But Power BI um, is going to be your data modeling tool, so um, it will at some point, I'm sure, replace analysis services and Azure analysis services, and we'll start to perform our data modeling um, and serve it out to the business as as, as the old word of cubes um, in the future through Power BI. Um, as, as we've seen as well throughout this weekend, we do use Power BI or we can use it as an ETL tool. Um, and from an ana analysis and visualization perspective, so for me, Power BI um, is, is very much an important player across the whole data e lifecycle and ecosystem. Um, what I try to do when I use Python is look at how I can supplement and, and make my life easier in Power BI, shall we say. Now, things like ready-made uh, machine learning libraries are absolutely fantastic for that type um, for those type of jobs and as i say this is very much a primer in machine learning but once you do get more familiar with using these type of um these type of kits then then you can you can take things the sky's the limit really and using power bi which is already ingrained in a lot of companies you're not just um you're not just using something bespoke and saying, right, here's the Jupyter Notebook or here's some Python scripts um, that I'm just going to hand over to you. You have something which has gone through and been vetted across most enterprise organizations. Um, so you're just you're just bolting on, shall we say. I'm sure I'm sure I, I think with Power BI getting into the organizational reporting tool when become an organization reporting tool, it makes sense to have that. And I think uh, to be honest, analysis services, I think 
no one got a big hang of it and i think it's going to go off with power bi becoming more a uh, user friendly in terms of that sense that makes it more easy uh, I, I, t- I totally agree and you you can i mean you can you can see this as well so we 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 in the power bi roadmap we've started to see um, the likes of um, object level security being brought into power bi i know that it's still in preview and only available via tabular editor but th- these type of functionality that we've had for years in analysis services, um, the Power BI team are really um, kudos, hats off to the Power BI team. So they're doing a great job of making uh, Power BI an enterprise data modeling tool um, re- very quickly. Um, so I totally agree with you there. Yeah, and I think I think DAX becomes more simpler than MDX. MDX was always <laughs> always uh, <laughs> was always more more difficult to you know, to but. Uh, when you do it for many years, I have learned it over the years of time. So, so I still have more control over MDX than DAX. But yes, but obviously with DAX becoming so popular across the language, so it, making it more easy language to be understandable. So yeah, it makes- I, I, t- I totally agree. I used to dread the days. Obviously, working um, as, as a freelancer, you'd you'd go to a new gig, um, and it'd be like, and they would say, right, we just have these um, legacy MDX um, cubes that we just need it <laughs> that we just need to update. <laughs> Um, yeah. So not good times. Um, what I will do, Prince, if it's okay, it, it sits slightly outside of Power BI, but I do have um, a, a nice trick to to show, if possible. Um, so I think Brian touched on this briefly in 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 his session. Um, yeah. What I'll do is I'll just go back to um, Anaconda. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my um, base environment. So as I mentioned to you before, you can do this very simply by using Activate. Um, and going back to your environment. Now, I did say at the beginning of the um, session that we would look at Spider. I think Spider is an, an absolutely fantastic tool to accompany um, Power BI in terms of um, in terms of data analysis and data data wrangling. So, if you just hit Spider in the terminal, it will launch Spider for you, which is this tool just here. Again, very much Python IDE, but something that I think. Um, complements Power BI really well is the CSV that we had of our labeled data. Um, again, as Brian touched on, we use um, a library called Pandas, and we can actually use Pandas to read um, to read our CSV and actually perform an automated analysis of the data structure for us. Okay. Now, again, I'm going to touch on this very briefly um, because whilst you can do this by utilizing um, Python within within Power BI, you won't be able to get the exported file, okay? So what we're simply doing here is just reading our CSV and with, we're running something called a profile report over this CSV and then we're going to output it to a file which I've called machine learning in Power BI. Now to do this, this is very much like SSMS, we just hit F5 and you'll notice that in our little window down here, um, we start to get um, an update of, of, of what's happening in the background. Now, again, not going to go too in depth on this because I know that um, it's it's slightly in keeping with Power BI and slightly slightly not. Um, so within this, you'll notice now that we have our machine learning in Power BI file. Um, now, just opening this up, as I mentioned, I just wanted to give you a very um, what I think is a very good trick to keep up your sleeve, um, especially when working with new data sets. Um, what this does very simply in four lines of code is give us an, a, a breakdown of the data within this data set so we can see the number of different um, columns that we have. So we have some ob- observations on if there's any missing data, any duplication of rows, how big the file is. And then it actually steps through and lets us know for each column what the data type is, the amount of distinct values, if anything's missing, um, the likes of the mean values, the minimum and maximum of the values within those columns. It does that for all of the columns. And then as we start to move through, it starts to look at the different interactions between the columns. So again, as as Brian touched on in the in the previous uh, the previous webinar, we can start to look at any correlations between the different columns. So we can see that obviously petal width and, and sepal width um, high correlation, same for petal length and sepal width. And again, it just goes through and gives you a fantastic analysis of your data set using three lines of code. So to do something like this, um, even from a Power BI perspective, and I, I'm, I'm putting this in just so that we can um, 
and Naveen has just mentioned it as well, actually, just took the words out of my mouth, my mouth the table.profile um, is the M function, which does exactly the same, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think table.m also uses some 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 libraries behind the scenes to do similar kinds of those libraries to get that thing done. Um, I think there's another question. Uh, I think you, you might want to take it. Do you think the days of SQL is over? Do I think the days, sorry, let's jump back to, to questions. Do I think the days of SQL are over? Um, great question, um, which has which has a, a very short and, and simple answer, but I'll expand on it. So my answer to that question is no. Um, so SQL is a language that's been around for over over 20 years now. It, it very It's very much the staple of, of data uh, and especially relational data. Now, with, with all the advances that we've had over the last, especially the last 10 years or so in terms of, I mean, we've gone to, to big data. We've seen the rise of machine learning, AI, um, Python, R, um, these new languages that have, that have come to the to the forefront. We've also seen, um, obviously, the likes of of, of no no SQL as well. Now, throughout this, um, there's been one staple. Now, every single engagement that I've worked on, and I'm I generally work on a new engagement every um, three to six months or so. Now. SQL has been a staple of every single engagement that I've worked on um, since working with data. And I'll also expand that to say very similar to Excel as well. No matter where where you go, you can't get away from <laughs> uh, from Excel. And it's very much going to be the same for, for SQL. I don't see either of those um, uh, either of those going anywhere from a data perspective anytime soon. Yeah, as long as you have a tabular data, it will remain there. And I don't think that we're going to go away from our tabular data anytime sooner. Exactly, yeah. exactly. As, as I mentioned, Prince, where you're where you're using relational data, um, you're not going you're not going to get away from from using um, SQL. Yeah, yeah. At least uh, not yeah. in my experience. Yeah, even even if you go sign apps as well, you have, still have SQL queries to query your non-structural data or unstructured data. Yeah, so so. In the end, it's there. It's it still exists till Microsoft is there. I think it's going to exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, f I think from 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 a Microsoft perspective, right? We're we're in we're in this environment now where Power BI is absolutely huge. It's an industry leader um, for data visualization, data analysis, and hopefully in the future, um, data modeling. I would probably say the analysis services is currently the leader. Now, with this, obviously, Microsoft with SS um, SQL Server, Azure. Um, um, analytics and the likes of Synapse Analytics is very much baked into the ecosystem. So as an industry leader, supplying all of the industry leading tools um, for, for data, um, it, it, it doesn't really make much sense to me for, for there to be a shift away from away from SQL. I think that's that's the question that I asked. I think uh, I, I think uh, the another question is how does auto ML? You know, that's auto ML feature on the data flows. Uh, it it gives you three simple models: regression, uh, general classification, and the binary prediction. How does it differ from uh, applying it on a ML? Because I did it both. I did have, have a comparison do it doing the comparison both using the similar kind of data set. So I got some different results. So that's why I was asking which will you prefer? And uh, what would be your take on it? Uh, yeah, for, from my from my perspective, um, I, I say use the tool that gets the job done right for you. OK, so for me, I like to have a, a little bit more control over what's happening when once I'm passing my data or preparing a data set or pushing it through um, the, the, a machine a machine learning uh, or creating a machine learning model sorry so for me I like to be hands-on with the tools as much as as much as possible which is why I would lean to something um, like Python um, obviously as we as we witness within this session it doesn't always go to plan um, and and sometimes you will you will come across some errors uh, which you do need to work through but the for me the benefits outweigh um, the negatives of actually using your own um, or the, the building, shall we say, on other people's libraries. Um, now, this doesn't detract from AutoML or um, Azure um, Machine Learning Studio because they are fantastic, um, especially, as you mentioned, using these functions within within data flows. But a similar question that I've been asked previously would, would be, um, would you use data flows? Um, now, for me personally, uh, my preference is always to use a relational uh, database where possible. Um, and use an ETL pipeline. 
um, which, which so the answer to that would be no to data flows. Again, it's a very good tool um, that Microsoft have, have put together and packaged for us, um, but I, I prefer to use um, code where where applicable, which I can source control, so the likes of SQL scripts um, and have dedicated ETL pipelines, etc. And it's the same for when working with machine learning. Uh, okay, um, that's uh, uh, obviously it, it depends upon who is working on it. For example, if someone new comes to me, I always ask them to use the auto ML features in the, in the sense that at least get a hang of it. If you don't know machine learning anything, it's it's a good starting point to understand and then start developing of your on your own post, which that, that, that sometimes I give the suggestions to my team members so that at least they get a hang of it. But obviously, if you are already aware of it, I think it's always if you knew it, I think it's always like that. Um, if I know my SQL, I'll do it on my own I'll, rather than asking someone to use someone else procedures or function. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, def definitely. I, t I totally agree with that. I think that we all need to we all need to start to start somewhere, which is and you need to start in the right place for you. So as you as you've mentioned there, Prince, if you're not familiar um, with 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 these kind of scripting tools or libraries, then Microsoft offers fantastic tools out of the box, which are very much um, as as Christian Wade would say, clicky clacky, draggy droppy, um, and you and you can do that with ease. What I would say that when you are using those kind of technologies, then do your research as well at the same time to understand um, what what's happening behind the scenes because this will allow you to upskill um, a lot quicker. It, don't get me wrong, it's, it's very good to start off dragging and dropping and using the built-in functionality but once you understand these these features and technologies and then you can enhance them with your own skills on top of that um, it just opens up the power you're not bound um, to waiting for an update shall we say to these functions you can go ahead and and, and progress something yourself yeah when you have your own Michael drive it on your own rather than asking someone to drive it for you. That, that That's for sure. Uh, I totally agree. I usually do use both because I do more of uh, data wrangling in Python, but I do visualization and so so I usually try to do it in that sense. But uh, yes, for a starting point, I always recommend them. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, thanks for a wonderful session, Leon. I think I think everyone enjoyed it. It was simple and sweet to for someone to start from the scratch. To be honest, yes, uh, everyone can now start. Uh, I think I think now we will see more of Python being installed in uh, uh, the Anaconda is being installed across uh, so that uh, people can start using it. Um, um, I'll, I'll post your question separately, not on this one. We'll have a separate discussion definitely on your LinkedIn chat <laughs> about, about about the predict predictability percentages between the uh, auto ML and this one. So that's something we'll have a, have a separate discussion for sure on LinkedIn. Um, happy to... Uh, uh, is there any question, guys? I think... The... Um, I think we've got to the majority of them. Yeah, um, I guess just so. uh, just scrolling through myself as well, um, and like I say, Prince, I'd be very happy to to go through um, the differences uh, with with you on a on a different session as well, and maybe maybe do um, um, maybe do um, a demonstration of the, of the differences would be would be would be very good um, to walk through and understand um, what's being what's being done different using something like PyCar and AutoML that might be good for the, for the community. Yep. Yep, I totally agree. Yep, um, I think uh, that's it. Uh, thanks, Leon. For, thanks a lot for uh, spending uh, a weekend for sharing your knowledge across to the whole community. Uh, much appreciated. Well, thank you very much for having me and putting on this event. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic and a pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks. Thanks, Leon. I'm going to stop the recording now, I think, uh, and then uh, we'll have a break for, for another 10 minutes and then we'll re rejoin the group, guys.